Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za You're listening to Inside Outer with Lois Moodley and Ben Teron. Hi and welcome to Inside Outer. I'm Lois Moodley, the Head of Communications here at Outer, the organization undoing tax abuse. The last year has been an interesting one for South African politics with the end of the Zuma administration and the new dawn under President Ramaphosa. Many organizations played a key role to bear the corruption and act as a catalyst for, to our new era. Our CEO, o, Ben Teron, catches up with the General Secretary at the SACC. Well, as many, many of you would know, the SACC, in collaboration with the Public Affairs Research Institution, PARI, published an explosive report on key state capture findings. After the interview with Bishop, Ben gives us a wrap-up of the state capture uh, inquiry and politics in South Africa currently. Well, before I chat to him, listen in to this conversation Ben is having with the SACC General Secretary. Less corruption, more accountability. Stay tuned to Inside Outer. Hello to our listeners. Today I'm joined by Bishop Mpulwana from the South African Council of Churches, SACC. The SACC played a major role in restoring integrity in South Africa with their report called Unbund- the Unbunding Panel Report that was released in on the 18th of May 2017. Good afternoon, Bishop, and welcome to the show. Good afternoon, and thank you for having me. Bishop, in your report, um, the SACC played a major role of a confessional, and I know that you personally had to listen to confessions by many people who felt guilty in the role that they played in the state capture, the, 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 the panel, as you, the unburdening panel, as you call it. Why do you believe people came forward to the SACC? Well, first of all, we we did this because of the the uh, the, the revelations by Mkabisi uh, Jonas and Fiki Mentur and Temba Maseko. When that came out, we called the ANC and said, "What are you going to do about this?" And they said they're going to deal with it at the National Executive Committee that was upcoming. It is that committee that decided that people must come to the office of the Secretary General uh, to report. And uh, no sooner had that happened than Minister Lamini uh, from New York said that we would never discuss this in NEC. All hell will break loose if we do because all of us have got our small onion and skeletons. Mm. We went back to the Secretary General, Gwede Mandash, and said, oh, hey, so if you all have got your small onion skeletons, how can anybody come to you? Mm-hmm. And, um, and then in that case, we would create an alternative channel for this, but also it would then open it up to non-ANC people because the assumption is that only ANC people would feel comfortable to go into the Secretary General of the ANC. Mm-hmm. So in fact, this is a much broader pastoral process. With, and I then asked, if we had people come to us who would like their information to come to you, would you receive it? And they said, we'll gladly receive it. Mm-hmm. And so we then created this process with a view to having four channels. One if people are members of the ANC, they want their matter to go to the ANC, they would go to the Secretary General. If people felt aggrieved personally and that maybe their human rights have been violated, they should go to the Human Rights Commission. Mm-hmm. If people wanted the matter to go to the public protector, we would send them to the public protector. And if people wanted uh, criminal proceedings uh, to emerge, we will then let this you know, be a criminal investigation processes. So it was really an open... It, it depended on the person who's talking to us. But then, of course, uh, in the main, actually, people that spoke to us were victims of pressure for right. corruption, mm-hmm. many of whom had not actually acceded to it and they had lost uh, their opportunities. But there were some who had done things, uh, however big or small, you know, but they had done stuff which they knew was not should not have been done. Mm-hmm. And they, they, they said, look, I, I can't sleep with myself. The reason I'm coming is so that I can have peace of mind. I can go to bed knowing that I have told the truth. And, and that's really what we're offering as a service. But we had also intended, and we planned for this, we had lawyers. <clears throat> they were pro bono advocates in Johannesburg uh, through the Bar Council, uh, facilitated by one of the law firms, uh, you know, as it is, it is uh, um, uh, Hogan Levels, 
they, who then had offered to, they brought all the other lawyers along. And we then had, through this group, people that would depose legally every person so that if their evidence were to be used in the future in any court case, it would be available in an appropriately laid out way, which would not happen if just a priest was listening. Right. <laughs> and it is this process that people were afraid of. They didn't want to talk to a lawyer, they just wanted to talk to a priest. <laughs> Subsequent to that, events have un- overtaken us, mm-hmm. and currently the state capture inquiry is underway. Talk to us about your thoughts about the state capture inquiry, society, etc. I am delighted that the, the state capture inquiry has, has actually been finally you know, been launched. When uh, it was recommended by a former public protector, uh, uh, Tulima Donzella, we thought it was really the best thing that could happen because it would then bring uh, all the truth to light, but it also enable a process where law enforcement process, you know, processes can, can also begin following what comes out of that, of, of that process. Now, it would bring a lot of confidence, we thought, to the public of South Africa to know that these things can actually be surfaced and they can be dealt with appropriately. And that's what we hope that this will do. But the only way it can happen is if people really come forward and tell their story and are able to say what happened. We need more of those. We've seen the people that have gone there, but they are the same people that went to the public protector. Mm -hmm. We would want to see more people. Uh, I know for sure that there are people that I know who would who should go there, yeah. uh, and, and, and uh, um, we'll do everything we can to encourage them to go there, but a lot of them are afraid. Um, I never thought there would come a time in the democratic South Africa where people would be so fearful for their lives. But then, you know, people are actually getting killed. Mm. People are getting death threats. I mean, if a, if a person with a public profile can get death threats, what happens to a small person who can easily be snuffed without anybody knowing? And so that's part of the problem. Some of them are saying... If, 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 if my story is told, even if my name is not used, they will know it's me mm. because it's my story, they know it. And, and so that's the environment. We're living in a, in a frightening mafia environment where you get killed for being upright. You spoke about the mafia mm. um, and, and the effect of that. The SECC has been and continues to be instrumental in the history of South Africa in its mission to restore justice, reconciliation, and integrity. Talk to us about the role of the SEC going forward, because we cannot afford to have a mafia state being, being entrenched in South Africa. We did not fight so long just to have a mafia state. Talk to us about that. We have every opportunity in this country to have a great future. It's, 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 it's almost in our fingertips. We have the wherewithal, we have the resources, we've got the skills, we've got the goodwill, we've got... Um, a, a commitment to walk away from a past that divided and broke us apart. We have it within our hands. It's really just a matter of do we stay on course with that trajectory mm. or do we allow selfish greed to derail the direction we're taking? And I think there are three things that we could do and maybe should have done earlier. One of them is to say that we make serious education of our constitution and what it says, especially the meaning of governance. Mm. Uh, It just so happens that last night was an award evening for two great uh, uh, veterans of of, of public service, and that is Dr. Zola Squeya, the late Dr. Zola Squeya, and uh, Professor Stan Sanguin, who was the... Both of them helped build the civil service that we have today from 1994. And I want to read a pledge that uh, really ought to be the pledge that every every civil servant should take upon themselves. And you know what? In his acceptance speech, this is what Professor Sanguini read. It's, for, it's a code of governance for executive members, employees of public service, board members and officials of public service, public, public enterprises, the SOEs. I pledge my loyalty and allegiance to the Constitution of the Republic. Therefore, I shall at all times uphold, maintain the Constitution of the Republic. To this end, I shall at all times act in compliance with the core values and principles enshrined in the Constitution. 
Therefore, in all actions I, in discharge of my duties, I shall conduct myself with a higher standard of professional ethics and spurn conflict and of interest. I shall promote and maintain economic, effective, and efficient use and management of human and financial resources in public administration. I shall ensure that public administration is, develop, is, is development-oriented. I shall ensure that public services are provided to all citizens of South Africa impartially, fairly, equitably, and without bias. Commit myself to respond to people's needs promptly and to encourage the public and participate in policy making regarding services to them. Encourage the public to participate in policy making. I commit myself to accountability for all my actions in the charge of my responsibilities and to this end shall hold myself open to public scrutiny on all actions. Foster transparency by providing public with timely, accessible and accurate information. I shall adhere to meritocracy by ensuring that employment and management practices in public service, state-owned enterprises are based on merit, ability, objectivity, and fairness, not on whom I like. I shall ensure that no employee in the public service and state-owned enterprises is favored or prejudiced only because that person supports a particular party or cause. So help me God. This is a universal basis for being in the civil service. Now, the first thing, therefore, is to promote the Constitution, especially in the civil service administration. The second thing, the second thing I believe, is that we ought to have certain values that we promote and uphold in our society. You know, it sometimes can be said that what Ben has done is an ANC. That's all very well if you're a member of the ANC mm -hmm. or an DA if you're a member of the DA. But I would like us to talk about what is un-South African. Can we agree on what makes us a common society as South Africans and say, to be a South African, truly uh, own that identity. These are the standards you shall uphold. Teach these in our churches, in our schools, in our public radio, everywhere. Make sure even in the initiation rites of those cultures that do them. You want to be a good South African citizen. These are the hallmarks of what that means. We have to build values. And that's part of the reason why the, the, the intervention that we have now of the National Convention Processes, the SACC, talks about values and standards because citizens hear all the time political parties talking about policy options that they are proposing. We have with this big one called the National Development Plan. It's a document of policy options, but you know what? Unless it has got values towards which it is leading and standards by which you will measure if they are getting anywhere, you will not be able to measure anything. And so citizens protest every day. Why? Because they do not know what is on offer. And what we are saying is, give a little example. If you say these children, a child must the, the life of a child must be secure and be given the best opportunity. That's a value. What are the standards that it takes? Does that she have shelter? Does she have a parent that cares? Does she have a school that does mm -hmm. not have pit latrines? Does she? You, in other words, there are certain standards you must say. These are the standards that will make sure that this provides for this child. Now, all that the government has to say of these twenty standards by which you will judge whether we are upholding this value we can only fulfill the first five in the next two years. Please give us the chance to do that. Mm. Then we know we don't have to protest about yeah. number six and number ten. <laughs> we'll, fo we'll focus on this. Otherwise, we protest about everything because we don't know what we're offering. Okay. What role can the church play in holding government to account? And I think you started touching on that right now, talking about the government need to plan short term and actually deliver on those as opposed to just selling a dream and not achieving anything. Talk to us a little about that. Well, it is not only just about what they offer now. It is also about where it is going. In the South Africa We Pray For campaign of the South African Council of Churches, we have identified certain areas that where there needs to be a reimagination, redesign, and a reorganization. And these are a full, comp comprehensive effort at healing and reconciliation of our society. We are a wounded society. And therefore, every little thing sparks and ignites fire because we're a wounded society. We need to deal with that and be own up to it. Even the leaders are wounded leaders. <laughs> mm. um, I mean, there are times, only very rarely, and I believe I'm a healed person, there are times, though, even with me, that my torture moments come back. When I, when I listen to mm. Pumla Williams say that, and I, I could identify with that because that does happen to me too, because I was also tortured. And, and therefore, there is a need to deal with the woundedness 
in so many ways. Children that grow up without a sense of self-esteem are always going to be a problem when they grow up. So there is a need to deal with the woundedness across the board. Now, secondly, we need to deal with the poverty and inequality, and therefore an economic transformation for a reconciled economic dispensation is necessary. This whole issue about land is about that. It's not necessarily always because people are looking for land. It is a cry for dealing with the iniquities of the past. Mm. That must be dealt with at economic level, including a regional economic reorganization that recognizes that the development of Johannesburg is the underdevelopment of Maseru and of Lilongwe, which is why you've got economic immigrants from the neighboring countries. We cannot deny that. We've mm. got to deal with it. Now, for thirdly, we've got to deal seriously with the issue of education. You start to educate for economic productivity. That's why we've got graduates now who have no jobs because mm. our education is not articulating to industry and productivity. Mm. We need to deal with that. And fourthly, anchoring democracy in a way that ensures that there's integrity of governance. Now, we are calling and working with society to set up values and standards that will then be used to monitor. And we have agreed that this must be a, a rolling process on an ongoing basis. We need to set up a monitoring. I know government has got a monitoring department. We need our own, mm -hmm. <laughs> a civil society-driven one that can be able to say that we're actually seeing that the progress is happening. The churches are willing to participate in that, but it's not a church's only thing. It yeah. is a South African citizenship mm. issue, and that together we should be able to do with other faiths as well as with non-faith communities. You're talking about interfaith, so it's not only the church, but, it, but other religions need to be involved now as well. How do we rally, how do we mobilize communities? Because the communities are tired, they are hungry, they are despondent, and we need to lift their spirits. Of course, we would like all civil society organizations that are membership-based to play their role, whether it is trade unions or even, for that matter, football clubs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone should play their role. Um, but we can speak much more directly about what we can do through the churches. I'll give an example of what we think is possible. What we're doing right now is to develop what we call election, electoral integrity 2019. Electoral integrity 2019. What does that mean? It is based on, the, on, on, on three assumptions. The first one is that the integrity of South African elections is based on the fact that there is an ongoing interaction between the IEC and the political parties so that political parties are always comfortable with any decisions that are made by the IEC. That in itself gives <clears throat> confidence in the electoral system. Secondly, every polling station on election day has got political party observers. Mm. Which, and actually, if you sit there and watch in the counting of election, of, 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 of ballots, they are there right through and they can actually take pictures of the final count. For that reason, you cannot cheat, you cannot change it when it gets onto the computers, which is very good. But then you see, if you've got a smaller party or an independent candidate who doesn't have the capacity to be at every polling station, they will always believe that they are being cheated, whether it is true or not. The perception will never go away. And that's what leads to electoral conflict. Now, what the churches are doing now is to say, let's organize local people of integrity, whether they are church people or not. In every polling station, we want to have 10 of these. That's three in the morning when the opening, three come at noon or lunchtime, and four or six come at the counting time. So that we call these people a party observers without a party. Mm. But it must be people that everybody in the neighborhood recognizes to be people of integrity, to be people that can be nonpartisan, and people that are upright. What that does is to build an infrastructure at the community ward level of churches partnering for public good. And we'll be using the same infrastructure to deal with poverty, with the same infrastructure to deal with economic hubs. We want to build economic hubs. What we think is economic transformation is not about tenders. It's about enabling people to be productive where they are. And so that whatever money, whether it is social grants money, it must circulate within that community before it goes out. And that is why you need to equip the local people to be productive, including producing their own vegetables 
it certainly sounds as if you're talking directly to the constitution because the constitution is about by the people, for the people at the local level. And it's exciting stuff that I'm hearing here. Just to take a step back quickly, um, so African Council churches have a long history, even before 1994. Are there any similarities right now, and how do you see the future unfolding for South Africans, just in that context, as we close the conversation? The South African Council of Churches was formally launched in 1968, and so, in fact, this year is our 50-year anniversary, it's our jubilee, we're having our celebrations in November. But those who were around at the time will remember what was called a message to the people of South Africa. It was a message of hope that we can get past the divisions of the past into a future we can all be proud of. And that led to a program in partnership with the Christian Institute called Sprokas, which was a study program of Christian action in apartheid society. But it was a series of issues looking at labor, looking at education, everything. So what we're doing now is no different from what we did back then. We were dealing at the time with apartheid. Mm. And we then committed ourselves to a just society. A just, we had a program called Justice and Reconciliation. A just a reconciliation based on justice. That's really what the, the message was. And we are now, what we then said at this time is that we are missing the delivery of the promise of the post-apartheid South Africa. And that's what the church leaders came to analyze in 2015. And they said, we want to restore the promise of the post-apartheid South Africa, which was a society that is just, that is reconciled, that is free, that is peaceful, that is equitable, but sustainable, mm. that is free of racism, of tribalism, of xenophobia and free of gender prejudices. A society that is free of corruption and deprivation because corruption leads to deprivation. And therefore, a society where every child born will grow to its God-given potential. And the point is, the time is now. The time is now, Kinako. Yeah. Bishop, it was a pleasure having you. Thank you for coming in. Uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you future. for having me and thank you for your role also in this work. Thank you, sir. Demand good governance. Join us weekly on Inside Outer. Well, Ben, that was a really interesting conversation. But now let's delve into uh, what's been happening at the State Capture Inquiry. You've been there almost every day. Can you give us uh, your take on what's, the, what's been happening, the highlights? It's been very exciting. Remember the headlines when it broke with Jonas, uh, when Fakey Mentor made the headlines. Those are headlines with just the bare facts because a newspaper article only has so many characters that mm. can have. What came out through the testimony is the detail, the absolute detail about the arrogance of the Guptas uh, threatening him and his family, Fakey being threatened, etc. So that's the exciting part. But remember, the hearing started off by setting the scene about the rules of the game. How mm. do people, in fact, apply for tenders? How do they get them? What are the levels of authority? So when J J uh, Mr. B.C. Jonas came on, he shared with us a very personal journey mm. about how he and how he uh, experienced uh, the threats and the offers made to him, which he declined ultimately because he's a man of stature and a man of integrity. Uh, Fakey mentor as well, um, and she was. It was an emotional journey mm -hmm. for her. She sat there in tears mm -hmm. the day when she arrived back to the hotel, and the hotel is unlocked. There are th subtle threats being played over there. So we believe, and I firmly believe that the truth will be uncovered. The veracity of the testimony will be tested with cross examination. The designer Zuma suddenly has uh, agreed that he wants to cross examine. Uh, as well as give testimony. I think he's in for a tough ride because he's been implicated uh, in the Gupta leaks as being a pivotal person in this process. Mm -hmm. So we're hoping that a lot of things will come forward. Uh, and remember, the ultimate goal of the, of the commission is to uncover the truth, number one, and then secondly, mapping the way forward to stop that uh, happening even in the future. I'm looking forward to hearing um, Barbara Hogan speaking because remember she was a sitting minister yeah. and she was taken out of uh, out of her position and she was replaced then with uh, Gigaba and then Gigaba was replaced when he was moved to Treasury by um, Lynn Brown. And we have in fact um, linked Lynn Brown and we've, we will be presenting evidence to the commission in that regard. So this is an exciting journey 
And this is only the first two, three weeks of it. So we're looking forward to an absolute uh, beautiful uh, few months lying ahead as it, as it unfolds. Well, that's so much explosive stuff to come. Thanks for tuning in to this special episode of Inside Out, co-hosted by myself and Ben Tehran. It's a pleasure. And no doubt South Africans from all walks of life need to join in this conversation that will end corruption. Corruption, in my opinion, is most rampant when people turn a blind eye. And we cannot afford to turn a blind eye anymore because this is our future and it's in our hands. Well, indeed. Please join me next week as we continue to challenge the status quo and we speak to influencers who steer South Africa towards a path of accountability. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za